ourselves today in the heart of the Italian Food Valley, a UNESCO World Heritage Site for the uniqueness and quality of some of its food products. In the specifics, we find ourselves in the town of Parma, a town that gives its name but also is the birthplace of products like Parmigiano Reggiano and Prosciutto di Parma. As I've told you, I'm a chef, so today I want to cook for you a dish that showcases the seasonality and quality of some of Italy's best products. So before we start, let's go shopping. Non c'è male, grazie mille, molto bene. Devo preparare un piatto con verdure invernali. Pensavo a cose come broccoli, cavolfiori, verze. Sì. Puoi aiutarmi? Certo, Grazie. vieni pure. Vengo. After vegetables from Chiara, we're going to see Francesco, another one of my friends, for another very important ingredient. Parmigiano Reggiano is a PDO cheese produced exclusively in the provinces of Parma, Reggio Emilia, Modena, Bologna and Mantua. The milk from the morning and the previous evening is poured into the traditional upturned bell-shaped copper vats. The milk slowly and naturally coagulates thanks to the addition of rennet and a wee starter, rich in starter cultures from the previous day's production. We are now just outside Parma, in the center of the production area of one of Italy's most famous cheeses. An ingredient that is absolutely wonderful by itself. It's made with 100% raw milk and no added ingredient whatsoever, so no preservative whatsoever. I'm here to meet my dear friend Francesco from the Dairy Fava, a caseificio fava, to get one of Italy's most famous cheeses and also one of the greatest cheeses in the world, Parmigiano Reggiano. After a cooking process, the cheesy granules sink to the bottom of the cauldron, forming a single mass which will give birth to two twin wheels. Wrapped in the typical linen cloth, 
The cheese is then placed in a mold which will give it its final shape, identified with a unique and sequential alphanumeric code. After a few days, the wheels are immersed in a saturated solution of water and salt. This last passage closes the production cycle of Parmigiano-Reggiano and starts its maturation period. The minimum maturation time is 12 months, and only at this point it can be decided if each individual wheel is worthy of the name it was given at birth. After 12 months, the consortium experts carry out a test called quality inspection on all the wheels, and the conforming wheels are marked with a hot iron brand, thus becoming Parmigiano-Reggiano. Ciao Francesco, buongiorno. Ciao Carlo. Come stai? Tutto bene, eh? Molto bene, grazie, molto bene. Meno male, dimmi tutto. Eh. Devo fare un piatto per il Calago da Festival e vorrei che il parmigiano fosse il protagonista. E cosa mi consigli? Adesso ti faccio assaggiare un 20 mesi. Volentieri, molto volentieri. È molto buono, ma hai qualcosa di un po' più stagionato? Sono curioso, assaggiamolo, ha una bellissima punta. Appena tagliato. Ecco Carlo, tutto tuo. Grazie mille. Com'è? Molto buona. Appena tagliato. Va benissimo. Va benissimo. Perfetta, sì, prendiamo lei. Grazie mille. Grazie a te, Carlo. Ciao, buon lavoro, ci vediamo, Grazie, buona giornata. Ciao, ciao. A presto, ciao. that we have all our ingredients, it's time to cook. But before we do that, I'm gonna show you the place where my dreams have become a reality and turned into a passion. Alma trains cooks, pastry chefs, bakery chefs, sommelier, professional waiting staff and restaurant managers. Alma is based in the heart of the food valley, in the beautiful Ducal Palace of Colorno, only a few kilometers from Parma, which in 2015 was proclaimed the UNESCO Creative City of Gastronomy in recognition of its heritage of PDO and PGI delicacies and culinary specialties. Alma's educational philosophy is based on and inspired by Maestro Gualtiero Marchesi, the father of modern Italian cuisine. From its foundation as a school of cuisine in 2004, when the only course available was the advanced course in Italian cuisine, Alma has become a school of Italian hospitality, training the next generation of food and beverage professionals. 
The courses and masters offered by Alma are exclusively professional in nature. The standard of teaching is upheld by a teaching staff composed of leading cooks and pastry chefs, established maitres and master sommeliers, as well as the most renowned Italian food connoisseurs and highly qualified experts in nutrition, food hygiene, and the history of food and wine. Furthermore, Every week, the team is joined by a visiting professor, including chefs with one or more Michelin stars, master pastry chefs, and food and beverage managers from large hotels and catering establishments. Unique to Alma are the tailored courses it runs in Italy and abroad, both for professional training and corporate team building activities, ensuring ongoing professional development. As you can see, there are many international students that come to Alma every year to turn their dreams into a passion. Many also come from India. I'm now going to introduce you to one of our Indian graduates. Hello, I'm Benita from India. I have graduated as an engineer in information technology from India and worked in the same field. I graduated from Alma in Italian cuisine and have been working here for the last few years. I worked here as chef de party in Central Kitchen and my responsibilities were basically all the varieties of bread production and varieties of fresh pasta production, as well as teaching the students and taking care of the production for our Bar Italia. I am also the graduate Alma Chef Ambassador for the Italy-India culinary art exchange and sharing between the two countries. Uh, the experience at Alma is uh, very precious for me and it is very valuable in a way because I have lived here at Alma being a part of the Alma family and I grew here, spent time together, so it's a very beautiful part of my life. Also I graduated and I trained here and I have had the wonderful opportunity to work with eminent chefs of Italy. Mr. Pa Chef Paolo Lopriore and Chef Valeria Piccini. And I have met many other wonderful chefs from this country through Alma. Uh, the, my connection to the traditional and culture of Italian gastronomy is a personal love affair. It has not been a specific or a special moment, or a special moment, let's say. Um, it has been a continuously growing, living and organic phenomena that has grown over time and it is a continuously in me. It's a part of me. Uh, the element common between Italian and Indian gastronomy is the vibrancy and the emotion that uh, an Italian or an Indian attaches itself to food. Uh, even the emotion that I find towards food is the same here too. Every Italian, they attach food, not just as food, it is an emotion, it is a celebration. And in both the countries, the mother and the grandmother are the best cook. To participate in Kalagoda Film Festival is a beautiful opportunity and I am humbled by this opportunity. Here I represent Italian cuisine in India, the Italian food which is a part of culture from Italy to India through Kalagoda Festival to be among the various artists and connoisseurs of food, arts and culture. Now the time has come to get into the kitchen and start cooking. Now that we have all our ingredients, it's time to put them to use. We're going to prepare a primo piatto, a pasta course, so namely a first dish, one of those dishes that comes after the starter but before the main course, which are very characterizing of Italian cuisine. And in the specifics, we're going to prepare gnocchi. Gnocchi are a preparation that relies on potatoes. They are its main ingredients. You want to make sure when making gnocchi to choose a potato just like this one. Ideally, we say red skin potatoes are very good or a potato that is not particularly new or fresh. So something that has been harvested in the summer and is ready to go. The beginning of gnocchi as a preparation is very, very simple. All we need is a pan and potatoes. Don't peel them, don't cut them. None of that is necessary for the moment. We're just gonna put them in a pan, cover them with cold water, 
put them on medium heat and allow them to cook thoroughly. Since it takes some time for the potatoes to cook, we can carry on with the other preparations that make up this dish. We're gonna use seasonal vegetables because really Italian cuisine is all based on seasonality and it's in the specific we're going to be using different types of broccoli if we can so say but at the base of this plate we're going to be making a fondue of parmigiano reggiano this beautiful cheese that as you've seen is really at the center of food production in this part of the world if you buy a wedge of parmigiano reggiano and you find these little white dots on it don't be scared that is a sign of quality and also, in this specific case, we want to use a cheese that has been aged for 18 to 24 months. And you'll be able to appreciate this just by looking at the crust of the cheese. It's going to be nice, thick and firm, which tells you that this cheese has aged for quite some time. All we need to do to create this fondue, which is going to go at the base of our plate, providing a lot of flavor, is to grate Parmigiano Reggiano and then melt it with a little bit of cream. So only two ingredients for this preparation. With the cheese grated, all you want to do is put a pan on low heat, add the cream to it, almost bring it to a boil. You want it to simmer. At that point, we're gonna be adding the cheese, we're gonna lower the heat a little bit, and we're gonna start the preparation until all the cheese has melted into the cream. The Parmigiano Reggiano fondue is gonna be one of our two sauces. White in color, and we're gonna be balancing it out with a green sauce made with broccoli. Broccoli-based sauces are very common pairings for pasta in Italy. Especially in the south of Italy, you will find a lot of broccoli sauces that are either chunky or maybe broken down somewhat, used to dress pasta. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be breaking down the florets. So we're going to be taking off these little branches of broccoli and then we're going to be blanching them before we make the sauce with it. Another important ingredient is going to be cauliflower. We're going to do exactly the same thing that we did for broccoli. We're going to be taking the beautiful florets out and we want that shape. We want these round little domes that are um, basically the makeup that we want to use the round little domes that make up this beautiful shape, this round shape, and we're going to be using it in our plate. We're not going to be doing much with this ingredient. We're going to be blanching it and seasoning it. We're not going to go any further than that because we really want to provide this bite to our dish. And another bite that our dish is going to have is going to be provided by this beautiful type of broccoli, which is called broccolo romanesco. It's very typical from the center of Italy, especially as you can hear from the name, from the town of Rome. Romanesco means from Rome. Again, it's utilized as a vegetable in many dishes and preparation, but also is the makeup or is one of the ingredients that make up a lot of pasta recipes. And this to um, maybe someone who is foreign to Italian cuisine might sound a little bit odd, broccoli in pasta, but really you want to remember that the majority of pasta sauces in Italy are based on vegetable ingredients that are not tomato. So you will find pasta with tomato, but you will find pasta with a lot of vegetables. And this is what we're trying to do here, vegetables only. And all we want to do is take the florets of each individual vegetable, nothing more. Try to get consistent sizes. So the florets there are a little bigger and don't match. The smaller ones can easily be cut in half. The same thing you did for broccoli, you want to do for the cauliflower. So take the bottom of the cauliflower out, put the leaves on the side, and start by separating the individual florets. We're only going to be using the smaller ones. So the large ones can be used in other preparations. Obviously, the top of the cauliflower is only going to have very few small florets. So don't worry, because every single individual floret, larger floret, is composed of lots of little ones. So you can easily get your knife in there and obtain smaller florets. And there you have 
the florets that we're going to be using. Once again, decoration, but also very much taste and consistency in our dish. As I said for the broccoli, don't throw the core away. This is very good. You don't even need to peel it. It's just something that you can slice and utilize. And also remember that the leaves can also be cooked and eaten. So try not to throw these ingredients away. And we want to do exactly the same thing for the broccolo romanesco. First of all, cut the base off and all the leaves. And then make sure to separate all these beautiful, knobbly, wonderfully shaped florets. Really, it's a, it's a wonderful shape. It's incredible that Mother Nature can do something like this. So with a knife, start from the bottom and take or separate the florets from the stem. Because of the nature of this vegetable, it's very easy to obtain small, be beautiful, really. They look very, very attractive, florets. And as you move from the bottom to the top of the broccoli, you will be obtaining greener and greener florets. Once all the florets are ready, you want to blanch them. So a pot of hot boiling water that you're gonna season generously with salt, and then you're ready to blanch. Start with the cauliflower, the wider product, then move on to the Romanesco and finish with the normal broccoli. The normal broccoli go last because obviously we're gonna use them into a sauce, so if we have a few of the imperfections, almost so, of uh, the, the florets, of the crumbs from the other two ingredients, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna be blending it anyhow. We can now move on to the last preparation, which it's going to have at its core cabbage. Very typical of wintry dishes. It's going to provide crunch in our recipe and also a lot of flavor. We're going to be using this uh, beautiful leafy structure, if we so can say, uh, cabbage has, and we're going to be pulling these leaves apart. Okay. Um, once you have the cabbage leaf ready, I would urge you to cut a long its main groove, like so. And once again, this is not waste, use it for another preparation. And then follow, once again, the leaves natural grooves. This is gonna leave us with, um, if we can so call it like some chunky strips of cabbage that we're gonna be cooking in a mirepoix. And if you don't know what a mirepoix is, I'm gonna explain you in a second. It's now time to do the mirepoix. So mirepoix is a very basic preparation that you'll find in many, many recipes throughout many different cuisines. And it's composed of carrot, just a simple normal carrot as we know it, uh, a little bit of celery. And for this preparation in the specifics, we're gonna be choosing the center part, like the, the least um, green, the, the tenderest part, the more tender parts, okay? And I'm gonna take a little piece of celery off here, and we also be gonna utilizing an onion. So mirepoix is really the union of onion, celery, and carrot, and the, it is considered to be the, the basic flavoring um, substrate, if you, if, if you so can say, of many different recipes. And we're gonna be using it to season our butter and also be the crunchy component and also an extra component, flavor component, in our cabbage base. Peel the carrot, top and tail it, again, you know, don't, no, try to make as little waste as possible. Give yourself a little shoulder to cut on and then cut, I'd say approximately half a centimeter to a centimeter wide slices. Once you have them, cut them into half a centimeter to a centimeter butternets. You wanna make sure that the cut is as square as possible. And then 
you will be left with this very pretty and functional, if we can so say, cut of carrot, which is going to be the base of our mirepoix. We're going to do something very similar for the celery. We're going to top and tail it, or we are more so going to top it and then cut half a stick of celery. We're going to try and flatten it as much as possible. Trim it just lightly. You don't want to trim it too much. And the same thing you want to do with the second half of the celery. You have two sticks that are, I wouldn't say perfectly flat, but you know, they are as flat as they can be for celery. So we don't want to create waste. So we're going to cut them into two long strips. And then again, we're going to try and obtain this very functional and pretty almost cubes of celery. They're not perfect cubes, but we like that. You know, this maintains the natural shape of celery. Similar process we want to uh, apply to dicing of the onion. So we're going to peel it from the top. Once the skin is off, we're going to remove the bottom, a little bit of the top. We're going to cut it in half. Let me clean my chopping board a little bit. Okay. Make sure that there is no green sprout in the center. If there is, we eliminate it. It doesn't taste particularly pleasant. And then we're going to dice the onion in a shape or size that is as similar as possible to the one that we have chosen for our carrot and celery. We give it the center cut, we compose it again, and then here we are. And again, it doesn't have to be a perfect cube, but it has to be something that is as close as possible in size to the previous two cuts, but also maintains the shape of the onion as, as alive or as close to the natural product as possible. In a frying pan over medium heat, put a generous dab of butter and allow it to melt. Once that has happened, you can very, very gently pan fry your vegetables. A balanced mirepoix has about three parts of onion, two parts of carrot and one part of celery. And that's pretty much what we're going to be using. As soon as it starts foaming, the first bubble are showing, we can go in with our ingredients. Onion first then carrot, and then celery. You want these ingredients to stew gently in the butter without getting any color. And more so, you don't want the butter to burn. You just want to keep everything as close to its natural color as possible. Be very, very gentle. This is also the point where you could add a little bit of seasoning, which will help the onion lose its bitterness. Once all the vegetables are nice and soft, but they still have maintained their original color, you want to add the cabbage. Put it in, season, give it a quick stir, make sure that the heat is in the pan, that the cabbage is getting hot. Oopla. Get a lid and a little bit of water. Add just a little bit and cover it immediately. Allow for all that steam to form inside the pan and gently cook the cabbage as well. It's going to take about two minutes. Once that is done and your leaf is nice and wilted, but not dark, hasn't lost any of its color, we know we're ready. And this is exactly where we want to be. Wilted, soft, but still bright and green. Give it a quick flip and then 
immediately remove it from the heat. It's gonna keep cooking for a while, but you want to make sure that you take it away from the heat. You don't wanna leave it on a hot surface because otherwise it will cook too much. It's now time to think about the broccoli sauce. We have the broccoli blanched, but we need two more ingredients. The first one is garlic. And we want to use, if possible, a milder type of garlic, maybe a white garlic that is not too pungent. Break it in half or crush it to the best of your abilities and take a couple of cloves out. We'll need about two, no more. You also want to make sure to individually crush every single garlic clove, obviously take the skin away, but also take the sprout away. This is gonna, again, be very, very pungent and we don't want it in the final recipe. So do this for both of the garlic heads that you're gonna be using. And here we are, the sprout goes away, we don't use it. With the garlic clean, put again a frying pan over medium heat and once again, put a generous dub of butter in it. A few of you are probably gonna be asking why we're using butter and not extra virgin olive oil. While it's true that most of Italy utilizes extra virgin olive oil as its preferred cooking fat, if you were to find yourself in the northern part of Italy, you find that butter really is the cooking fat of choice. This is because this area of the country is not really suited to the growth of the olive tree. So you don't really have big or large productions of extra virgin olive oil. So butter really becomes the cooking fat of choice. And this recipe rests uh, on the flavor that Parmigiano Reggiano apports to it. So by utilizing butter, we are keeping the same, if you could say so, fat family, dairy family. So we're using dairy, we're using milky flavors, and these are gonna be the underlying flavors of our dish. As soon as the butter has melted and it's beginning to foam, it starts to foam, then you can add the garlic to it. Fry it very, very gently. Allow for all the flavors to develop. And we're gonna be adding one more ingredient to this recipe, which are salted anchovies. Anchovies are utilized really throughout the country and they are a, an ingredient that apports a lot of flavor to recipes. And traditionally it was also used instead of salt because being salted itself obviously adds a lot of flavor to preparations. So we're gonna fry our garlic very, very gently in butter and we're gonna be adding one anchovy. We're gonna allow it to melt into this butter and only at the point the broccolis are gonna go in. As all the ingredients are frying, make sure you break down the anchovy with the spoon. It will help you really release this flavor into the butter. And if you were where I'm standing right now, you could really smell all this beautiful garlic and uh, anchovy flavors that are coming out of the pan. As soon as there is vigor, and you can see that um, the garlic is starting maybe to brown a little bit and the anchovy is melted nicely into the butter, you can add your broccoli. Remember, this is the base of a sauce. So if you see that your pan is drying up as it's cooking or as the steam is developing, make sure to add a little bit more water. Don't worry about the seasoning for now. We're gonna be seasoning the sauce once we've blended it. Test them, ensure that they are as soft as you want them. And once they are at the right point, put them in the jug of a blender. Don't forget to add all the cooking juices and also the pieces of garlic that are left in the pan. If when you're blending it, you realize you don't have enough liquid, feel free to add a little bit of vegetable stock. You want to make sure that the consistency of the soup is right. It's just as you want it. It has to be spoonable and also season it. This is the point where you want to taste it and make sure that it's where you want it. It has to taste like broccoli, but you also want it to have a little bit of a punch because it's a dressing, it's a sauce, so it has to have some character. 
with all the other preparations ready, is now time to focus on gnocchi. And if we've timed it right, then we are at the point where our potatoes are cooked when everything else is done. Make sure that once the potatoes are cooked, you drain them. So here I have potatoes without any water in them whatsoever, but they're still hot. And this is very, very important. Apart from potatoes, you're gonna need common flour and also one egg. You can say that the perfect recipe for gnocchi is one kilo of potatoes, 200 grams of flour, and then one egg. But the first thing you want to do is peel the potatoes. Skewer the potato with your fork and then gently peel it. This is also the point where you want to take out any imperfections. With all the potatoes peeled and they should still be hot, enters the potato masher. You want to, or ricer, depends how you call it really. You want to rice the potatoes into a bowl to begin with so that you can add all the remaining ingredients. Now that you have all your potato mashed, you can add one egg to the mix. You also want to make sure to season your gnocchi now because there has been no salt in this preparation. And start stirring potatoes and egg together and then gently add the flour. You want to do this when the potatoes are neither too hot or too cold. You really want to find the perfect balance. So you ideally are going to be able to touch them without them bothering your hand, but you don't want them to feel cool to the touch either. You can do this job in a bowl, but you can also do it on a surface. And I'm actually gonna be moving this on my work surface, so make sure it's really clean, because we'll have to put our hands into this preparation. So, ready? Three, two, one. And just like you would do for normal, like egg pasta, for example, if you're making pasta by hand, you wanna use one of these guys to cut the flour, this is the technical term, into the dough. So move it around, start mixing everything together, and then eventually you start using your hands once the dough comes together. You want to make sure that gnocchi feels like the dough that you're doing or making feels kind of right to the hand so you can work it, it stays together, but you almost want to feel it like it's starting to fall apart. You don't want it too congealed. If it's too congealed, the gnocchis are gonna be gummy and this is something you want to avoid. Gnocchis must fall away, must melt away in the mouth once they're cooked. So this is obtained by adding not too much flour, but just enough flour so that the gnocchis come together and cook properly. Once you see that cutting the dough doesn't really work anymore, you want to start putting your hands into it. So fold it, the dough onto itself and really work it. When I say really work it, I mean work it till you see that all the flour has been incorporated into the dough. Don't go any further. You might want to get it to the point where it's nice and uniform, but you don't want to work it too much. You don't want to develop too much gluten, which will make the preparation, again, a little bit too gummy, which is something the gnocchi shouldn't be. And I'll say we can stop here. So the dough has come together. You can still see a few bits of potato. That is okay, it's not a problem at all, but we're not overworking it. So somehow it feels still a little sticky. This is something nice, this is something we want. We're gonna flatten it somewhat into a shape that is easy to handle. We're gonna clean our counter and also clean our hands. With your surface, free from any large lumps of dough and your hands clean, get a little bit of flour, dust the dough a little bit and also dust your surface. Then with this tool, once again, cut pieces of dough that you know you can easily roll into a rope.
roll them out on a surface, like so. Make sure you work with a little bit of flour, but not too much, okay? You can use common flour here, like I'm doing, or you could also use a little bit of durum wheat flour, semola rimacinata. Once you have this shape, cut pieces of dough that are about the size, let's say, of a large hazelnut or maybe of a small olive. And then have handy a tray with a little bit of parchment paper. To finish gnocchi off, ideally, you would want to use a tool like this. This is called a riga gnocchi or a gnocchi groover. And literally, it's the tool with which we are going to obtain gnocchi. So we're going to roll our dough onto this surface so that our gnocchi are going to get this beautifully groovy surface. If you don't have a riga gnocchi or a gnocchi groover, don't worry. You can also use the back of a fork. Exactly the same procedure, but this time you're going to be rolling the gnocchi on a fork. The grooves are going to be a bit bigger, a bit wider, but nonetheless, you're going to be guaranteed with a suitable result. All our ingredients are ready, so the only thing we need to do now is finalize our dish pot of hot boiling water that I'm going to salt only as it begins to boil, not any time sooner. Generally salted, you want to make sure that any uh, water you use to cook pasta in has a reasonable amount of salt, but at the same time, I have a frying pan on the heat and I'm gonna add a little bit of butter to it. This is the pan in which I am going to drain my gnocchis when they're once they're ready. I start melting the butter now because gnocchi cook really, really quickly. As soon as they reach or come back to the top of the water, so we come back to the surface, we want to strain them, okay? Maybe wait 30 seconds maximum, no longer. They will become horrible otherwise. They'll soak up all the water and become mushy. With the water still boiling, my gnocchi are gonna go in. Bring the water back to the boil and allow the gnocchi to cook really, really quickly. In the meantime, I'm going to season with a little bit of oil and salt my vegetables that have been already preheated. And I'm going to make sure that my fondue is warm and my cabbage is ready to be warmed. The gnocchis are almost done. It's looking good. Quick reheat to my cabbage. Just a quick blast of heat. We bring it back to life, no more. And obviously we will need a plate ready as well. The gnocchi are starting to float, so I'm happy with the way they look. I might add just a little bit more butter to this pan. The gnocchi are floating, they look really, really nice, so I'm going to gently scoop them and put them in my foaming butter, very, very gently. I'm gonna take away the water from the stove, but I'm gonna keep it handy because I might need some for the gnocchi. Medium to high heat and make sure you flip them all face down. So you want the grooves to face down. This is because you want them to roast and we want to, that roastiness to show in that part of the gnocchis. Use a non-stick pan if you have it, it's best. And make sure to fry them gently, not over vigorous, vigorously. I wait I wait for the cabbage to come back to heat, but in the meantime, I'm gonna keep moving. So first thing, my fondue of Parmigiano Reggiano. This, as I said, is gonna be the sauce that is gonna go on the base of my plate. So first thing, 
a good dollop right in the center. Don't worry, the sauce is gonna kind of like leave its own. Don't worry, the sauce is gonna move around the place itself so you don't need to do much. Make sure my gnocchis are doing well. At this point, I will go get my cabbage. Leaves in the center of the plate to give elevation to my dish. And also, let's not forget that we must add some of that beautiful mirepoix. Let's also remember that we have some wonderful green sauce and I want to dab this sauce around the plate as well. Be generous, don't be shy. This is a nice flavor component that we want in there. Let's check our gnocchi. Oh, they look beautiful, ready to go. Give it a toss, make sure they're nicely coated in butter. and pick a few up and start dressing your plate with it. Make sure you have the gnocchis nice and flat on the plate. And now let's finish with our florets of broccoli. Make sure that they're visible and try to make sure that they are pointing up as well. You want to really be able to see the consistency of, or at least the shape of these ingredients, both green and white. We're almost ready. Just to finish off, let's make sure we give them a dab of fondue to finish off the plate. And also just a few dots of green sauce. And there you have them. Gnocchi alle verdure di stagione e salsa verde. Wow.